So really pleased to welcome to Life in Six Strings one super talented guy. Not only is he the guitarist in his band Devil Driver, but he also mixes and produces. Now they're just on the verge of releasing their greatest work to date with the album Dealing With Demons 1. That's right, I said one, so that means there is a number two. Mike Spritzer, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. You're good, how are you? I'm pretty good. Uh, pandemic isn't treating me too badly, happy, healthy. And, uh, and I've been so busy with other things that uh, I'm actually busier now during a pandemic than I ever have been before. <laughs> what are you up to? Are you producing? Yeah, I finished. I've been working with some local bands in LA and um, I'm mixing. I just started mixing a band called Tortured Sane out of Toronto. Right. Working on that and uh, got the Wednesday 13 record coming up in January. That's cool. Okay, great. So I guess I kind of want to start at the beginning with you um, and talk about kind of who was the guitarist that set you on this path? It wasn't really a specific guitar player. I guess you could say it was Steve Clark from Def Leppard. Okay. Because when I first heard them was when on the, you know, when they released Hysteria was when I decided I want to play guitar. And then uh, Metallica was probably the or definitely was the biggest influence for me growing up well um so so you, so you mentioned hysteria being one of your, your your first sort of influences what was it about that album that you liked because it's a funny i mean for me it's the production skills on that that album it's mutt lang it's like he completely transformed the band um was it because it was obviously you produced as well so i wonder like was that kind of what appealed to you as well do you think it might have been something to do. I mean, I was only six years old when I first saw the Pork and Sugar video. So <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. Maybe it was the lifestyle <laughs> yeah. that I saw in the video. Um, I don't know. I just, I got really into Def Leppard. And then I actually, I mean, I prefer their two records before history the most, High and Dry and uh, Pyromania. And when they were more of a, just a straightforward. Rock band. Rock band. When yeah. they new album as we say so like the new wave of uh, British heavy metal um yeah they were I guess Mark kind of changed all of that didn't he for them I mean he produced High and Dry as well but um yeah he definitely slipped them up a bit yeah I mean history was a much I mean it still sounded like Def Leppard but that was my first exposure to the band so I started with Hysteria and worked my way back yeah like I did with Metallica you know I discovered them on the Black Album and worked my way back and there are quite a few gems working, you know, back with Metallica right there. It's basically that's their best catalog still to this day. What's your favorite? What's your favorite Metallica album then? Justice, which a lot of people find. I mean, yeah, from a production standpoint, it's not the best sounding record, but there's some records that I like. What people would call bad production, you know. There's a lot of. Uh, ministry records out there that i wouldn't say are the uh best sounding records on earth but that pr the production that they did just gives it this special character that that i like yeah i guess it's something like you know if you listen to exile on main street by the stones i mean that's that's quite badly produced it doesn't sound great it's raw it's a raw album isn't it which is great um, I'm not too familiar with that record, but I I know what you're talking about. So what so what kind of what kind of stuff do you do you prefer the kind of slicker, really heavily produced stuff or? I like both, honestly. You know, I had a friend tell me one time that he thought Downward Spiral by Nine Inch Nails was wasn't a very well produced record, and I was just like, dude, you are. I will. It was it was it was one of the members, the previous members in my band. I won't throw him under the bus, but. <laughs> um i was just dude you are absolutely insane i mean i love the production on downward spiral i think yeah. it's it fits the record perfectly you know but uh i like the over polished stuff you know i th still think the black album is amazing i like hysteria um you know like dr feelgood from motley crew back in the day is another one one of those records mm -hmm. but 
it's as long as it has character that's all i'm really looking for you know but there are a lot of black metal bands out there that i like their music that i cannot listen to them i could go see them live yeah and some of like behemoths old way older stuff they play some of those songs live but i can't listen to them uh the recorded versions of them it's why just... because it's just too much going on well, I've toured with them, and some of the songs that I love so much, I saw them play on, you know, on a nightly basis for the better part of, like, six weeks. And then when I finally went home, it was the same thing. And same thing happened to me the last time we toured with Danzig. I forget what song it was, but there was a really cool song off his newest record at the time, and this was close to 10 years ago. But, you know, I went home and found the recorded version of the song, and I was just, I can't listen to this. It was, it was better live. So what was your first guitar? It was a Fender Squire. Okay. And I still have it. It's not here. I, I it's at my it's in a closet at my par <clears throat> at my parents' house somewhere. And I got it when I was ten or eleven years old. It it doesn't look like a normal Fender Squire. It's it's black, red, and blue. It has like these lightning bolts going through it. It's a really thin body, kind of like uh, an Ibanez. Mm -hmm. And it's got a Floyd Rose on it. I bought it off my guitar teacher for like $300 along with a Gorilla amp. And that's, that's don't cool. have the amp anymore. That thing broke, but I still have the guitar and I never play it. It doesn't play well. It's a piece of shit. But <laughs> I, mean, I, so I don't want to sell it. it. I wouldn't build, I'd probably be able to get a hundred bucks for it at most too. So no, you wouldn't. I bet if you sold it now, because it belongs to you, you'd probably get more than your 300 bucks for it. Maybe, maybe three fifty. <laughs> yeah, we well, haven't got the amp, I suppose. That's the problem. You had the amp. With uh, the amp. Yeah, the amp broke long, long time ago, but still have the guitar. So, what was your first kind of guitar that you bought that you felt like, okay, this is in the big league? Well, the first, the first big league guitar is actually over here. Now, I didn't pay for this one. This was the first ESP I got when I joined the band. And, you know, it's, they don't make these anymore. You know, it's got four knobs and the cutout is a little bit different than the way they cut it out now. It's kind of a, a wider cutout. And they don't have four knobs anymore, do they? No, they only put three on there yeah. for the most part, at least that I've seen. And it's a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter than, uh, some of the other eclipses I have, I love eclipses. That's pretty much, I mean, I've got like probably close to 10 or 15 of them, something oh like my that. God. That's your signature guitar was an eclipse, wasn't it? No, the other guitar player that's not in the band anymore, Jeff, he had an eclipse and I had a, had a Flying V. Oh, uh, the Flying V, which is the, is the one that you normally play live, isn't it? Yeah, I have a white one now that I usually play live that I like better than the, the one that was a signature series, but I, I still use that guitar for like one song because I have to tune up for Clouds Over California. So I usually use that one for Clouds and then switch back to the white one. Why did you, why did you go for a, fly, a Flying V for your live shows? When we were on OzFest 04, we were out with God Forbid, you know, and there are two brothers on the, in the band, Dallas and Doc, and we were doing a lot of off dates with them. And I specifically remember watching them in, I think it is a, place called ground zero and i think it was in north carolina total shithole and um doc was you know i was playing this guitar this exact guitar on that tour yeah. and he had one as well yeah, but his brother was playing the uh playing a flying v it was actually i think it was dave mustaine's signature series guitars like this big king v that was silver with a black pick guard Mm -hmm. and just watching them live I was just like okay that V looks way cooler than my guitar and that was it I got that the ne very next tour I asked ESP for that same V and I've been playing V's live ever since I don't like playing them at home I never touch them at home but why why don't you like playing them at it's home just it's too awkward, you know, just you're playing classical style or, you know, you can't play with the guitar like this. And I go back and forth because my back bothers me if I sit okay. down too long. So, I'm, you know, I'm constantly playing this way and then I'll do this and I'll lean back. I'll put my foot up on the, on the desk <laughs> and kind of do that. I'm, I'm all over the place. 
Okay, so what, I mean, what was the first riff that you learned? Can you remember? Uh, it was something off Paranoid, Black Sabbath. Sabbath, yeah. Um, I think I had my teacher uh, teach me how to play uh, Iron Man, but I wasn't really good at the, uh, the sliding part in the middle of the riff, and eventually he taught me Electric Funeral, and, you know, that's a pretty easy riff to play, so that was probably... Yeah, Perfect. someone taught me, because I've only been playing, I decided to, the whole idea of this show is that I decided to learn how to play guitar during lockdown. Oh, it's been fun, let me tell you, but um, it's like, it's something I always wanted to do, but I never had the time to do it, and so, you know, I've been having lessons every week, and then chatting to guys like yourself, um, and women as well, um, talking about you know, the love of the guitar, basically. And I, I, someone taught me Iron Man. Which is oh, they did? Yeah. So you're just starting? I've just, I've literally just started, yeah. I've got, um, yeah, but I've turned into like a gear gearhead. I can't, I'm, I'm becoming obsessed with it. My guitar, my guitar teacher's like laughing his head off because he's like, what has happened to you? You're just like, I want every, I want a flying V for sure. They look, they just look super cool, don't they? <laughs> But the Iron Man one, what is it? It's, come on. See, this is, this is our rubbish item. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it, you're like, oh, that takes me back. <laughs> I'm at that really frustrating have... stage where I really want to play like yourself, just be able to just pick it up and, you know, give it all this and I don't just come and I'm like, oh, it's really tough right now. It takes time, but baby steps, little by little. So, I mean, so did you have lessons? I did off and on. I... My parents actually made me take lessons because of the threat of me not going to college after I graduated high school. They were like, well, if there's any chance you're gonna refuse to go to college, then you're taking lessons so you can get better. And I started taking, I see, I had, th no, actually I had four guitar teachers in high school. I had, the first one I had, I was not in high school when I was growing up. First one I had it when I was six, hated her. Um, it was like, basically getting lessons from like Joni Mitchell or something like that. Like it was just like all this acoustic hippie rock crap that I was just not into. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to the black album and stuff, it's like, no, nah, that's not good. No. Happen. Yeah. And I was just really into like Def Leppard and a lot of hair metal bands at that point. I mean, I was six and that's pretty much what we had to offer, you know, or MTV had to offer anyway. Um, and then Let's see. My mom finally found me a guy that was a metalhead in town named Brian, and he was a good teacher. He was the one that taught me, like, Iron Man and um, a lot of other cool stuff by Black Sabbath. Pretty much the whole Paranoid record, yeah. you know, for the most part. And uh, he got me into Metallica and Megadeth and, you know, started teaching me some of that stuff. I remember he taught me how to play Symphony of Destruction and uh, started to teach me holy wars too but that was a little beyond my ability at the time and uh after that i stopped taking lessons for a little while and then i started back up again with uh, a guy named tj that is i still he still lives around here and he's he's not into music a whole lot anymore but absolutely amazing guitar player that you know mostly into like blues and like stevie ray, ray vaughn type of guitar okay. player and he was the one that started teaching me music theory. So when I went to college and you know, became a music major, I was really happy that I took lessons with him because he, he get, gave me a start so I didn't go into the music program completely blind. Yeah. And I, I was still blind and feeling around a lot with the stuff they were teaching me, so to speak. But uh, he, he taught me a lot of good stuff when I was in high school. And you went to university as well, didn't you? I started out at Santa Barbara City College, which actually had a much better music department than the university in Santa Barbara. I mean, miles better. Yeah. And so I was getting a shittier education at a university where the tuition was 10 times as much. 
but I did, you know, I started out at the city college there and then I transferred to UCSB and I never finished. I had one year left and, but devil driver asked me to join the band. So I was like, you know, rock and roll's cool. If I'm finishing college later. Yeah. Are you going to, are you thinking about finishing it? Cause you can still finish it, can't you? I'm actually thinking about trying to do it during the pandemic because yeah. I could probably do it all online possibly. So I've, I got all my transcripts <laughs> recently from uh, the uh, the courses that I finished, but I have not. Uh, I haven't contacted a counselor, and I want I want to finish it at UCLA because I, I'm I'm closer there. Oh my god, you've got to do that. That yeah, would be I'd that like would be hilarious. That. that would be great. After all these years to go right, done, finally done it. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because you were talking about like you know technique and stuff like that and, and learning the theory side of it. I think it was M Machine Gun Kelly recently said that, um, what did you say, that you don't have to be technical to be a good guitarist. I mean, would you agree with that? Totally. Um, our old bass player, John Miller, is a great example of that too. He, he was one of the best songwriters we've ever had in the band. And, you know, when everyone would bring, you know, we had, you know, four guitar players in the band at that time <laughs> as my drummer played my bass player played and then there was me and jeff but and miller out of all of us he was i mean he was a good bass player but he wasn't a very good guitar player but he would write these amazing riffs on one string and they were not technical but they were just really really cool I mean, all the time, he just came up with this co really cool stuff. And a lot of this stuff is all played on one string. It's like, how did you write another cool riff that sounds completely different than the last one or the last 50? Yeah. And it's still just on one string. I mean, he was very, very talented at it. So, yeah, you don't have to be an amazing guitar player to create awesome music. Look at Kurt Cobain, for God's sakes. I mean, he was... Yeah, he, I think that's what Machine Gun Kelly said, actually. He was talking about... Um, uh, Kurt Cobain saying that he was a huge influence on him and he wasn't, you know, technically fantastic, but he had a really, yeah. that but feel, a, isn't it, as well? He had a feel, and if you go listen to, you know, I was listening to to a song on um, their Unplugged record, you know, which was done live and not doctored. I mean, it's it's nothing super technical, but it's still hard to play solid and in time and find that pocket with your band. And listen to him play guitar on that and you know it's i don't hear anything wrong with it i mean in, in their own way it's flawless but uh and that could be a little difficult for some people i mean some people can't find the pocket to save their life but <laughs> if you give them a guitar you know i see guitar players out there that are hor horrible rhythm players but can just play leads and solos you know way better than i ever will but I'd rather be a good rhythm player than a good lead player. Would you? Why? Because it's more important. Yeah, I guess. It's like, you know, you're the heart. I guess the heart holding everything together, aren't you? I mean, you can go out. You, you can be in a, pan, a band and not know how to play a solo, but you can't be in a band and not know how to play rhythms. You're going to have to play rhythms at some point. So, yeah, I think it's more important. I think you got to become a solid rhythm player and then become a good lead player. And if you're a better lead player than you are a rhythm player, Start working on the rhythms. Some good advice there. I think I'm going to have to go lead, I think, because I'm terrible with the rhythm. I, have, I can't keep time. <laughs> you will. It just takes time. <laughs> it's all about time. Oh, my God. So, so you've got a new album that's coming out on the 9th of October. Um, it's a two-part album. Why Actually, we, it got bumped up to the second. I don't know oh, why. Okay, it right. was originally going to be released on the 9th, but it got bumped up to the second of October. Oh, well, that's good. We get it a lot earlier. A little earlier, yes. So um, it's called um, Dealing with Demons. Um, and like I said, it's part one, part two. Why did you decide to make it a double album? Des has always wanted to do a double record. And he would, I, I think he threw out the idea to do, of doing a double record for every record cycle for the last 10 years. And it's just, you know, I don't know if Roadrunner would have been behind it when we were on them. Maybe they would have. But writing that many songs in the past to me just wasn't really appealing. And, <laughs> yeah. But 
writing with the old guys in the band wasn't as easy as is with the new guys. And, you know, not saying it's the, their fault, the older guys. It was definitely my fault, too. You know, we were young. We were dumb. We were in our 20s, you know, and we just weren't very mature. You know, it was, it was all me, me, me. I want my wrist on there, you know, for the most part. And we weren't really thinking of the greater good of the song for the most part. And when Neil and Austin came in, and we, we never knew each other before, you know, we hired Austin off a recommendation off from our old producer, Mark, and he was like, this is your guy. And we're like, okay, he's our guy. He's hired. Haven't talked to him yet. Haven't seen him play. But yeah, he, if you say he's good, then he's in the band. And then we tried out Neil, and I was really blown away when he, uh, during his tryout, and uh, a solid player, and we just clicked immediately as far as being able to write together and for the last five, six years, you know, it's just lots of fun riding with them. We never argue. And I mean, never, there's not, we never had a single argument. And that's, good. that's always a, a good sign. It's just a good fun process and it makes things a lot easier. And, and then, so doing a double record with guys like that, it was like, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, when did you when did you start making the record then? We started working on it in 2017. Oh bloody hell! Okay, that was a long time ago. But I guess, like you said, it's a double record, and you're probably on tour and stuff as well, so trying to fit it in. in well, it, it actually, I mean, it's been done for a long time. I think Des finished vocals in I want to say maybe January. Yeah. Okay. And God, maybe even before that. It's been so long, but there was actually quite a long break between us finishing the music. And then I think he went and finished the vocals like almost six months later or three months later, something like that. And uh, so the record actually feels very old to me already. Because... <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't even had a chance to tour it or anything yet. Well, you won't. No, and we still don't. And, but, you know, kind of is what it is. And we'll probably save volume two for whenever the pandemic is over and we can actually go out on tour to yeah. support and promote it. You'll have to learn all those songs again. That's okay. This is actually the first time that I've ever learned all the songs that are on the record because usually the way we would do things in the past is whoever wrote the song would play all the rhythms. Whoever wrote the solo would play the solo and, you know, leads and overdubs were kind of up in the air and whoever was playing the rhythms would do it on, you know, there's always two rhythms recorded, sometimes four at least two though, one on left, one on right. And Steve noticed that I have a, Neil has a lot more low end coming out of his right hand for someone, just the way he plucks the strings. Yeah. And I got more high end when I play. I mean, we could be playing with the same guitar through the same exact rib, or uh, same exact rig, and you hand Neil the guitar, it's just gonna sound different the way he plays it. And so, Steve saw that and wanted him on one side and me on the other for dealing with demons. And so he first hit me up and he's like, well, this is how I'm, I think I'm going to want to do it. So you need to learn all the songs. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> like we're starting pre-production in two weeks and you want me to learn 20 songs. Like I was just like, it's just not going to happen. I mean, I'll try, but yeah. and the next thing I knew, I knew all the songs. So I was like, so this was a different way of working for you because like you say you normally had mark producing your albums and then you got steve on your last one the outlaw album. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and you co-produced it as well didn't you this record i did not that was a uh, um that was a mistake in the press release i had nothing to do with the production of dealing with demons i did engineer the the bass and the guitars for for the outlaws record at my right. studio but with dealing with demons I didn't produce a damn thing. Well, wouldn't you like to get your hands on, on, on one of the records and, and produce them, though? Well, I get that, that question a lot, and the answer is always no. I, I don't ever want to produce a Devil Driver record. I'm too close to the music, and I think it's really important to get an outside person that really has a lot of experience working with bands. And Steve's been doing it for 20, 30 years. And, I mean, he started when they were still recording to tape. That's how he got it started it was that long ago oh my god and it, it's just 
listeners see the, the, the music differently than the writers do. And I think that's important to get someone that sees it as a listener yeah. producing it rather than the writer. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes it's just nice, isn't it, to be who you're meant to be in the band as opposed to trying to do everything. Exactly. And I, uh, I don't, I don't mind engineering while I'm recording guitar at the same time. You know, I've done it, you know, when we were doing the Wednesday record necrophase and we had to take a break for Christmas, you know, they wanted to do that wasp cover, fuck like a beast. And, um, we were kind of running short on time. So I was like, you know, I'll, I'll just record the guitars for you when, when you guys would go home and, uh, you know, so I'll do it from time to time, but it is much nicer having someone there you know, hitting all the buttons for you in Pro Tools yeah. rather than having to do it yourself. You just get to sit back and be the talent. <laughs> nice. Enjoy it. Um, it. It feels to me as well like the track, one of the first tracks that you released, um, Keep Away From Me, it's mm -hmm. like it could be the soundtrack to what's going on right now. <laughs> Yeah, and that was just a big coincidence. Yeah. That song was written, recorded, and was actually chosen to be the first single months before the pandemic hit. Now we, we made the video around the you know the idea of the pandemic, but mm -hmm. a lot of people think that you know that song was like written for the pandemic or something like that, no. or not not even close. Just a weird coincidence. Yeah. So have you got um, a favorite riff of the um, album? It's, Keep Away From Me is my favorite song on that record. Is it? Yeah. Can you, can you play a riff off the, off the album? Just a little snippet of one. Uh, the main one is just the... Uh... It's freaking amazing. So you can hear it that really time? Good. I can hear that. That is oh so good. What makes a good metal guitarist? I guess you gotta be technical in some shape or form. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a subjective term these days, what technical is of you know, some people will say <laughs> come up to me like, how do you play that? Blah 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 blah, and then you know, they get some other people like, ah, that Devil Driver shit is just too simple to play. And, but, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, what I think about or what I do or, you know, like, I have some kind of, like, preconceived notion going on in my head before I write a riff. And, you know, it, it's just not how I do it. Maybe some people do, but I just sit around and noodle around until uh, I come up with something I like. I'll even sit here with a movie on my computer. You know, and it's usually something I've seen a million times and I'll just sit there and watch a movie and mess around and then all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, what was that? And I'll hit pause on the movie and then I'll kind of get to work. And then if I get stuck again, you know, back to the movie and Neil taught me that trick. He would, he would tell me while he was writing songs for dealing with demons that he would watch movies at the same time. I'm like, really? Really? I'm gonna yeah. Try, I'm going to try that. And it just kind of, I don't know, it kind of spaces you out a little bit. So you're not yeah. concentrating so hard. Because you're concentrating too hard on something. And you're, gonna gonna have, you're, forcing it. you're forcing it on you. If you're just like, oh, I've got to get something good. But yeah. But, I mean, if you can write riffs that other people like, I guess that makes you a good metal guitar player. Yeah. It doesn't have to be super technical. It just, I don't know. It's just got to have some kind of feeling, have some soul to it. and. You know, just, uh, you know, if you're releasing dopamine in other people's brains somehow through your music, you're doing something right. We've needed a lot of that recently, that's for sure. Yeah, people do need a lot of that these days. I keep on yeah. telling people to try to use the pandemic to their advantage. Like, 
you're not doing anything, you don't have stuff to do, it's time to learn a new skill. Like you've got plenty of time and I don't think this is gonna be over shortly. So go find a new hobby. Like playing the guitar. Like playing the guitar, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I did that as guitar and tennis as well, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Why not? Um, okay, so you're so talking about the creative process then. That's interesting. So you are you never in, you must be influenced though by some things that you hear, like other guitarists and stuff like that. I think everybody is, whether they know it or not. I had a the first band I was in in Santa Barbara was like a progressive black metal band and the guy that wrote the most of the music in that, he purposely didn't listen to other people's music. Because he was worried about stealing it. it. Sound, yeah, he wanted it to be very original. And I don't really agree with that. I mean, some people could do that if it works for you, but I think inspiration has to come from somewhere. And it's like, you know, you take, for me, it's like, you know, Marilyn Manson, Sisters of Mercy, and like KMFDM and industrial bands. And then I have, you know, a, a, my classical background from college, you know, and like the Baroque area, Baroque era was always my favorite, you know, like Vivaldi and guys like that, Handel, um, and obviously Mozart, Beethoven, and Bach. But, you know, and then I listen to a lot of electronic music and, you know, I've gone back and listened to riffs and it's like, you would never think Sisters of Mercy would be a big influence in Devil Driver, but I've gone back and listened to stuff and I'm like, God, that really sounds like Sisters of Mercy. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize it when I wrote it. So yeah, it's just like you have all these different influences and they're like ingredients in a recipe and you come up with your own your own special cake um do you listen to classical music then i do yeah sometimes when especially when i'm stressed out <laughs> or someone <laughs> i'm around other stressed people like um i never use classical but there was a time in with the band when we would get off stage and there, there uh something would go wrong and arguments would happen. And so I got in the habit of like immediately putting on Bob Marley really loud on my phone in the dressing room just to kind of make sure everyone was calmed down after the show because we have a rule not to talk about the show for the first half hour after we're done, unless it's positive. If you have anything negative to say, you just keep under wraps for a half hour, hour and wait until everyone calms down and you know, because is that because that everyone can get a bit irate just after you've come? Yeah, off I mean, you're more day. likely to get triggered at when you come off right when you get off stage because your adrenaline's pumping, and you just don't want to hear it. Yeah, you know, you might want to say it, and I'm guilty of doing this too, but I figured if Bob Marley was on the radio, <laughs> it's a <laughs> little hard to get really heated. <laughs> there is, you're so right. There, there is something about Bob Marley that just kind of makes you smile. Yes, yeah, like, like you know what? Fuck. Okay, I want to talk to you about something. You know, it's just like I'm gonna find a nice, calm way to bring this out into the open. So, <laughs> I I don't do that anymore. I didn't. I don't have to anymore. But there was a time where I I felt compelled to do that. So you don't put any music on after you've done a show now? No, not really. But as far as back to you know, as far as influences go, like. I don't really listen to a lot of reggae. There's a couple bands that I like, like Bob Marley. There's a band called Stick Figure that I really like. Mm -hmm. um, and But it, Industrial is my all-time favorite. Like, I wanted to be in an industrial band. I did not... I, an industrial metal band. I, would, I didn't want to be in a full-blown metal band when I joined Devil Driver. But I really wanted to join Devil Driver. Okay. You know, I just really wanted to, my friends were in the band, you know, all the guys we were in a band before Double Driver except for Dez. And just wanted to get out of Santa Barbara and go out on tour. And when the opportunity came around, I was like, all right. So kind of weird where you end up, but I don't know if industrial would have been the best genre to get into because uh Probably not. Well, you could leave. most industrial bands have a pretty hard time making a living out of it. Yeah, but why don't you why don't you try and set up a side project or something? I always have. It's just Des keeps us incredibly busy. <laughs> We're writing twenty songs, and now you've got Steve that's making you record every single one. <laughs> well, it's, you know, between 
touring six to nine months out of the year and then we finally come off if we were going to have time to do any kind of side projects it would be then but usually it's like all right we got to start writing for a new record and now between like producing and you know i have written music for uh i did a record a long time ago for a music library and they license it out to movies and tv shows and every now and then i'll be watching a tv show and one of the songs will come on i'm like hey check it out cool so I have released other things, but like I say, just, you know, Devil Driver keeps me busy. So have you guys been writing during lockdown then as well? Yeah, of course. Neil's got a bunch of songs. I've got a few. You know, we've got, we're only putting nine songs on volume one, eight on volume two. So there's three songs left over. So I do think there's going to be like an EP or... Make a volume three. It's a concept record, isn't it? Yeah, but we're not doing volume three like my the has amount anyone, of has anyone metal, ever done that the mental power i have left over for dealing with demons is done because we had to spend guitar players have to spend the most time in the studio you know drums were done in maybe 10 days 12 days something like that and but guitars there's so many different layers you know you got to do you know two rhythms of everything and you know you're laying layering overdubs solos leads all this stuff getting tones takes forever sometimes and um you know we used somewhere between 10 and 20 different amplifiers on this record you're joking we're constantly mixing every song has a different configuration of amps like neil's playing on one side with his guitar an overdrive pedal an amp and then going into one of the two cabinets that we had set up. And then I'm playing on the other side with a completely different configuration. So, so how's that gonna work live? Oh, you don't worry about that live. I mean, it's just, like, we, just yeah. I get that question a lot. It's like, how are you gonna replicate it live? Like, we're gonna, we'll figure it out, you know? It's like, if there's five guitar parts going on there, we're gonna pick the two most important ones, obviously. But with yeah. all the amps and stuff to create that same sound, I guess it doesn't matter if it's if it's not. No, exactly. I mean, you can it, even if you brought the same amp, the same cabinet with the same microphone configuration, and we had like six microphones set up on e in each cabinet, and we didn't use them all the time, but they were there, and we'd kind of pick and choose depending on the song and the amp and the guitar and the overdrive pedal. But um, if you take it into a venue it's going to sound different through the PA because every PA is different. Every room sounds different. Yeah, you know, the, the microphone configuration is going to get moved or bumped. It's not going to be exactly the same every day. So it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, it's just, as long as you have a good guitar tone and a good guitar tone and it works for you, just, you, you know, you roll with it. Besides, you don't want it to sound exactly like the record when you go no, see it. If you want to be a little different. <laughs> Bob Dylan doesn't do that, does he? You go and see a Bob Dylan show and he'll play a song and you'll be like, what's that? And then you realize it's like one of his biggest hits. But he's just changed yeah. it so much. Um, get me bored. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I mean, you know, fair enough. Um, what, I mean, what amp wise then? What were you, what, what amps were you using? Or were you just completely experimenting with different things that you hadn't uh, used? We used some of these over here. Got, you know, that's part of my amp collection over there nice so we had i didn't have that angle yet but i do have an angle preamp that we use we have i have a pv Rockmaster, which is just a preamp that we would go through another amp uh pv 6505 pv 6534 uh pv 5150 block letter um i had a friedman jj 100 jerry Contrell's amp yeah we had a Saldano, a Bogner Ecstasy, a Mesa Boogie. Um, we had a couple rectifiers there, uh, triple rectifiers. Yeah, you know, we had one of each. And we had one triple rectifier, one dual rectifier. I'm not sure how much we use those. I don't think we use those very often. But we also had a, uh, a Mark III, an older Mesa, and then there was one last amp that was a bit of an unknown. Uh, Steve shares a studio with a guy that um, played keys in Nine Inch Nails on the Fragile. 
mm -hmm. uh, record cycle. And I think so, there's some connection between uh, Billy Howardell and, uh, of Perfect Circle and Nine Inch Nails. I forget what the connection is, but somehow he had this amp that was, it was just the guts. It was not in a head casing okay. at all. And Steve was pretty sure that that was the amp used on Perfect Circle's first record. Oh, wow. So we had that to our disposal and we brought it out and, you know, it doesn't have any writing on it. So no one really knows what it is. Maybe Billy Howard Eld would if I could ever get in touch with him. But uh, we use that one as well. If you think about your career, like when you first started, where you are now, I mean, does it get easier? Does it, it like... Because part of me is like in the beginning, you're really hungry, you want this, and then you get older and maybe you get a bit jaded and then you can't be asked anymore. Like, does, does it get easier? Recording has become easier because I know what I'm doing and I have, you know, I've got some experience under my belt now. Um, I would, yeah, I guess it, it gets more, it gets easier, but it gets a little less exciting sometimes. Yeah. It's never the same as it is, in, you know, when I, because everything changed for me overnight. You know, one moment I was in my bedroom letting two of the guys in Devil Driver stay at my house in between tours before I was in the band. One of them showed up one day and said that they weren't going to Europe within flames because the other guitar player didn't want to go. And then literally three days later, I was in Sweden opening up for in flames. So it was just like, it just changed everything. I dropped out of school. I quit my band. I quit my job. You know, I moved out of the house I was living in. I, you know, and I couldn't afford shit, so I moved into my my uh, rehearsal space in Santa Barbara and lived there for a year. And you know, it was just so surreal going out on tour with In Flames and then going and doing a record at a world class studio and then going doing Ozfest 2004. You know, like that was my entrance into the whole music scene, which is, you know, usually people are, you know, in a van and, you know, I've, I've never had to do that. I got really lucky. I just got thrown right into this amazing band that was, you know, Des had already built a name for himself. So, you know, we got a pretty big boost right off the bat. And I don't know how Des did it. He, uh, you know, most people don't get a second chance in the music industry with another band. And he, he did, and he did it well. <laughs> yeah. You know, it doesn't happen very often. And I was just in the right place at the right time. It's funny, because I was chatting to Jennifer Batten last week, and um, she said the same. She like, went from playing to like 200 people to being on Michael Jackson tour. <laughs> You know, my last job in Santa Barbara was working at the UP. No, sorry. My second to last job was working at the UPS store. My last job in Santa Barbara was working at Starbucks, believe it or not. No way. So you know how to make a good coffee. Uh, th that was the coolest job I've ever had because like coolest day job because, you know, I was right next to the college. And so it was all just college kids coming in and, you know, I got to drink coffee all day. And then every weekend, me and my coworkers went and just and partied and got drunk together. Like, it was so much fun. I loved that job. But when I was at the UPS store, my manager was trying out for a, a music school called MI over here. And that's where Jennifer uh, went, didn't she? Yeah. And she did a clinic. And one week was Marty Friedman from Megadeth. Yeah. And then I think the next week was Jennifer Batten. And my boss, Kevin, was like, dude, Jennifer Batten's clinic was so much better than Marty's. Like, really? way more informative. And he was, you know, I've, I've never met Jennifer but, or, you know, like, seen her play in person. But he, I'll never forget that, how, how impressed he was with her at that clinic. Yeah, she's very, she's very technical. And she's yeah. got the feel. She's got it all, you know. She's very good. She's great. But um, so can, before I let you go, can you give me any tips on playing? Use a metronome. <laughs> Get that time so I can be a rhythm player. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you can't play something, I mean, first of all, just, I always tell people, just learn songs that you enjoy, you're going to enjoy playing that are not difficult. And just to get your fingers moving, build up that muscle and the muscle memory. 
Yeah. And if you can't play it, get your metronome out, start slow and just speed it up three to five BPM, you know, play it, get it comfortable, speed it up. If you're playing it and if you sped it up, you're not playing it right, slow it down a little bit and just, and one of my music teachers always told me when you're trying to learn something that's difficult, your subconscious is more open before you go to bed and right after you wake up. Oh, okay. So when I was ever studying anything that, you know, for an exam, I always make sure that I would review it, you know, like as I was drinking my coffee in the morning or before I went to bed and everybody's different, but it did work for me. It did seem to help. Okay, so basically when, when we finish this interview, I need to practice then, don't I? Yeah, because it's, it's, I mean, it's, like too, it's pretty late there for you, isn't it? Yeah. Almost 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I mean, if uh, maybe not so much with like being able to play it, that comes with, I've always found too that if I'm working on something, I go to bed and I wake up the next day, um, it's always light years easier. Yeah, I know it's what you mean. Like, yeah. Let your brain rest and get up the next day, go try it again. It will be a little bit easier. But if you're trying to memorize something that you can't remember where to place your fingers and whatnot, that's where the morning and night thing really comes into play. Okay, that's good. See, my guitar teacher's being a right bastard at the moment because he was teaching me songs in the beginning. And now I've just been starting to learn um, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd because it's quite a nice slow one mm -hmm. for that picking stuff. And, um, he won't teach me the actual song. He's like, no, no, you have to work out. He's told me what the chords are, but he's like, I'm not teaching you the strum or anything like that because you have to sort of, you have to map the song out and you have to learn like the, the, the corners of the room before you can do the other stuff. I want to kill him right now. I don't know that song, so I'm not going to disagree with him. <laughs> I've never taken that approach to teaching my students songs when I when I used to teach I don't teach anymore but he could be right I mean if he's a good guitar player he's must be, he must have done something right yeah I mean I'm glad that you say that okay right now I mean I might just go on YouTube and learn it <laughs> you could, yeah you could do that too that's another thing that I you know I wish was we had at our disposal when I was younger me yes. and my friends you know it was YouTube and all these different tools online because you know I was just using tab books. I and know so much harder for you then. It can be. I mean, sometimes it's easy, but sometimes just looking at tabs, it's just either they're done wrong or it's just it's like something's just not right. So, I mean, even when I've had to learn a, a solo from like you know doing a benefit concert when i'm not playing devil driver i'm playing pantera or iron maiden or mm -hmm. whatever it was and there's something i can't figure out you know like when i had to learn an iron maiden solo i went online to see how they played it and i find out that they're playing it different every night you know they're not playing it the same way so that doesn't yeah. help but then and this is a bit embarrassing but i forgot to ha how to play one of my own wrists one time and i went on youtube and found a guy playing it and i was like oh yeah that's right that's how you play it <laughs> You're joking. I'm not joking. I forget what song it was, but I actually did have to do that once. Because yeah. I don't keep on playing something, I forget for the most part. Not everything, but if it's a song that I haven't played in like five years, it's going to take me a minute. I'm going to have to go and refigure it out again. Yeah, because it's like one thing in and one thing out, isn't it? Like you're learning something else, so then you just forget everything else because you're just focusing apparently, on... Apparently, yeah. Apparently. Yeah, I'm like that. Um, well, I think that's it. That was a good chat. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was really good. Um, you know, hopefully I'll get to see you live soon. Hopefully. I'm ready to come back to Europe. I miss Europe. Have you got any dates booked in? We do have some tentative dates that were supposed to be in March, but obviously got pushed back and they might happen at the end of 2021. So, so we'll see. Okay. Fingers crossed. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. It's been great yeah. chatting to you. And uh, I guess I'll get practicing now and uh, <laughs> see you soon, hopefully. Okay. Thanks cool, again. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>